Um, but welcome everyone uh, to, I guess, um, our session on the first day of RightsCon. I'm really excited to be having this discussion. Um, there's very few people speaking um, about how content moderation is, is impacting specific language communities like the Persian community. So I'm really grateful for RightsCon for giving us this opportunity to have this discussion. Um, if you are watching from YouTube, um, let me just say this in Persian. I get as YouTube vas shodin ye link zire post YouTube hats ke shomara mi bara be safe ke be farsi zabun hame ye in session ot baratun tarjama mikona. Agar hanuz un link ko nadidin zire link ke tu khod YouTube. Um, so yes, uh, uh, thank you to RightsCon for doing simultaneous uh, subtitles so uh, our Persian audiences from across the world uh, and inside Iran can follow along with this discussion, which you know we have seen in recent weeks, um, has been really impacting the Iranian community. Uh, as we know, um, the internet and access to the internet is a highly contested uh, and fraught space inside of Iran. And in fact, um, META holds a special role inside Iran in that they host the only social media platform that is essentially not connected to the Iranian state that is uncensored. And so this is really important for you know, millions of Iranian users who don't use VPNs or are not tech savvy enough to, you know, um, turn on their VPNs and connect to Twitter or connect to Facebook or Telegram, which are, you know, other popular social media that the rest of the world uses that is blocked for Iran. Um, one of the major issues that we have been seeing, and I personally, as a researcher and advocate, have been noticing over the past few years is um, just amounts and amounts of content takedown in the Persian language. And so this is really the crux of the conversation we are having today, which is trying to understand um, exactly what is happening to Persian language users on Instagram, you know, on this last kind of space for freedom of expression and um, access to a unhindered uh, platform. Um, so there's a lot of different issues that have been going on. I mean, most recently we've been tackling the issues of protest takedowns. Um, and this discussion was really meant to bring together, um, you know, uh, folks who are content creators. Unfortunately, one of our speakers, Sina Valiola, couldn't make it to the session in the end, but he was a prominent content creator and he was going to speak from the point of view of, you know, producing entertainment or satire content and how uh, meta policies impact um, on that level. Um, but fortunately enough, we have uh, Rana Rahimpour with us today, who's a um, highly respected uh, Persian language and English language journalist who works for the BBC World Service and BBC um, Persian. Um, and she's has a lot of great perspective in terms of, you know, what the Persian community has um, felt in terms of using Instagram, um, the role of Instagram to help, um, you know, independent journalism um and various other kinds of content that she's been following that have been impacted by uh, meta's policies unfortunately we have another speaker that wasn't able to make it today that was julia weno who is one of the board members um for the for meta's oversight board um thankfully she sent us um a, a small five minute clip to kind of go over her positions um in her absence um which we're grateful for and i'll um and i'll show that after everyone introduces themselves and then we obviously have Mohammed Abu Shakra, please correct me if I'm getting the pronunciation wrong, but I hope I nailed it. Um, so we have Mohammed here who comes from Meta's policy teams. He specializes in DOI, which is dangerous organizations and individuals. Um, they will, I will allow um, our, you know, respected panelists to give introductions about why they're here. Um, and then can really get delve into the discussion and I'll I'll play Julie's clip after they um, introduce themselves. Rana, if you wouldn't mind starting, that would be great. Thank you so much, uh, Mahsa, and thank you, Mohammed, and special thanks to RightsCon 
for allowing this conversation to happen, which has been um, ongoing between media organizations and activists and Meta. And we're also, uh, as an Iranian, um, I would, I'm would i thankful to Meta for providing a platform for us to uh, share our news with uh, the viewers and for from the civil society with, with, without Meta, I can't, I'm not sure how many of us could have found out about what was going on inside the country. Um, but it's specifically for that reason why Meta becomes so crucial in our day-to-day -day job. As a BBC Persian um, journalist, we uh, rely a lot on user-generated content because BBC Persian, like many other Persian foreign-based uh, stations, we cannot operate inside the country and we rely heavily on citizen journalism and the content that those people risking their lives are publishing on platforms like Instagram, Facebook, and then us journalists, we, that's so, so, sometimes that's our only window into what's going on inside the country. That's why it's crucial for us. Also, um, BBC Persian has over 17 million followers on Instagram. It's the largest news, uh, Persian news organization on, uh, Instagram and this allows us to um, inform people inside the country of what's going on because the satellite channel is often uh, jammed by the Iranian authorities. So this, this, there's this dynamic relationship between media organizations and meta platforms uh, and it makes it very crucial. And as Mahsa uh, mentioned earlier, several stories, hashtags have been removed from Instagram and Facebook recently, which makes it very difficult. And we will get back to it uh, later uh, after we hear from Mohammed. Thanks, Rana, uh, and thanks, Masa. I'm extremely delighted to be here today. My name is Mohammed Abu Shakra. Um, I'm part of Meta's global content policy team, which is a global team located in 13 offices around the world. And our code core mission is to develop the community standards, which are the rules that through which we draw the line on content on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, before joining Mera, I um, bring 15 years of experience in civil society, human rights, um, intercommunal conflict prevention, and the last five years of which we're in the United Nations. Um, and I built most of my understanding about the dynamics between social media and freedom of expression through being one of the millions who joined in the streets and during the Arab Spring in Cairo and Alexandria. Um, so basically, I'm extremely thankful for RightsCon and Access, Access Now for organizing this session because it relates directly to me personally as well as professionally. And I'm so much looking forward to the discussion uh, today and all the details that Rana mentioned and Masa mentioned as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mohammed. I'm I'm really excited to have someone of your background here because you know protests is going to be one of the topics that we're going to be delving into, and you clearly have experience. So, um, in Julie's absence, I'm just going to start our discussion um, with the points she's going to make. So, I am going to uh, go ahead and share her um, interventions on behalf of Meta's Oversight Board. Hello everyone, I am so glad to be able to record this short message for you today um, to discuss uh, the ways in which the Meta Oversight Board can be helpful to Persian communities and others who are facing uh, particularly harsh content moderation practices from the part of Instagram and Meta in general. Well, uh, my name is uh, Julia Wano. I'm, of course, one of the members of the Meta Oversight Board, and I'm also a digital rights activist myself who has tried to highlight content moderation problems in other parts of the world. Uh, when I say others, I mean not the United States, not the European Union. Uh, I'm leading Internet Sans Frontières, which is a French NGO, and we have done extensive work in, in uh, Africa and in Latin America, and particularly in Brazil. Well, with regards to some of the decisions of the oversight board that might be helpful uh, in the cases highlighted today, I would like to mention three. I'm thinking, for instance, uh, about and not the, the cases per se, but rather the recommendations that we made through uh, making a decision on a case, because as a reminder,
Uh, so I think you've been muted. I can't hear you. Make broader recommendations oh, to which I made through uh, making a decision on a case. Because as a reminder, the board does make binding decision on cases, on specific cases that are submitted to, a, to us either by users or by Meta. But we're also allowed to make recommendations. And we do not hesitate to use the cases, the individual cases, to make broader recommendations to which uh, Facebook and Instagram must respond publicly and say whether or not it would implement them. So one of the recommendations we've made was to tell the company, uh, you must make sure that your community standards, your rule are available in all languages so that all users around the world can understand what exactly is or is not allowed on your platforms. This might seem as obvious, but uh, we found out at the Meta Oversight Board while studying a case from India, we found out that community standards were not available in Punjabi, which is a language spoken by more than 100 million people. Yes. The second recommendation that I wanted to highlight today, which speaks to uh, the internal processes and has shed light uh, on the uh, some of the dysfunctions, internal dysfunctions with regards to uh, content moderation and content and the, the guidelines that content moderators specifically receive. Uh, we've received a case that was dealing with the um, solitary confinement of the, the leader of the PKK, uh, a party that is not an organization that is not allowed, that is considered as a dangerous organization on Meta's platform and is therefore not allowed, you're not allowed to praise them. Well, uh, there was a caveat to that policy that did allow to discuss the uh, human rights violations of members of the said organization and particularly their leaders. And if I remember well, that caveat to the policy had been developed kind of specifically for the leader uh, of the PKK, Abdullah Ojalad. Well, that caveat got lost in translation. Uh, some way, somehow, it did not reach the, uh, in, well, the content moderators uh, who were supposed to apply it, despite the fact that this uh, policy had been existing since 2018. We received the case in 2020. Well, uh, this, again, is a, a way in which we have recommended to the company that it consistently uh, applies its uh, guidelines, its policies, uh, well, it, with content moderators consistently around the world, uh, that distance should not be uh, an excuse for uh, lesser content moderation, uh, robust practices, and seriousness. That's the second recommendation that I wanted to uh, highlight. Um, and that related to uh, uh, the, 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 some of the cases that have been discussed here, we have told publicly and recommended publicly to the company that Meta should publish uh, a breakdown of government requests for content takedown. This information, until the board made a decision uh, with regards to the Sheikh Ashra case, the, sorry, Sheikh Jarrah case in, in Palestine. Well, the, the, until that day, that information was kept, I would almost say secretly, by uh, the platform and by, Meta, uh, by Facebook and Instagram particularly. So uh, we have recommended the company to publish, uh, to be transparent about the requests it receives organizations from shadow government units um, to, to publish uh, the content takedown requests that they receive, such as the, the privacy violation requests that they receive from government. Uh, well, it's important to publish those information, especially at the time when democratic principles, when we're trying to build uh, as a community, as a world, uh, we're trying to build democratic principles that will govern, that must govern any endeavor on the cyber space. Um, well, these are three recommendations that I wanted to highlight, but of course we have made more recommendations than that. I think by today, it's more than 100 recommendations to which uh,
Sorry, I think uh, Julie's uh, Julie's interventions uh, ended abruptly, but I think they got to the crux of a lot of the things we want to talk about, which is, I mean, the oversight board is a really important mechanism by which um, we hope that a lot of the content takedowns we've been dealing with um, get recommended. As of yet, we have obviously not had a particular um, Iran focused or Persian language focused case. But like Julie said, there have been cases that have maybe helped um, inform uh, cases we've had, um, especially in terms of the use of DOI, dangerous organizations and individuals, um, and how you can look at the different nuances in talking about organizations uh, on that list, which I, I think is a is a thing that we encounter a lot because um, one organization in Iran is prominently listed on the DOI list. And there's ton, tons of news and content generated about that organization. Um, and so sometimes the nuances of, you know, if is this criticism of that organization, is this, you know, satire about that organization, we've often seen it get gets um, lost um, in a lot of the content we're discussing. Um, it's unfortunate that uh, Julie actually isn't here to, you know, engage in dialogue. I know they've also works beyond um, cases that can help inform the implementation of DOI. They've done uh, work on cases related to protests, which also has been relevant here. Um, so we had a, a plan of going tackling through different topics today um, and the dangerous organizations and individuals was supposed to be our uh, last topic of conversation, but I'm just going to move it up just so um, we can dovetail off of uh, the, the interventions that Julie made. Um, so I, I would love to turn to uh, Mohammed, who I know um this is this is kind of your expertise doi the famous doi list um one of i think the problems and i i've had to have this discussion with a lot of iranians because you know they depend on instagram but they don't often know transparently you know what the red lines are like what are all, all the organizations on the doi list and so far i think the only kind of information there has been has been a leak by the intercept that listed a lot of the organizations and you know, I've I've spoken to content creators that do satire on politics in Iran, um, like one of the the speakers that was supposed to be on today, and they said, you know, they've referred to that leak in the Intercept to make sure that they're not crossing any lines, they're not, you know, mentioning any of the banks that are on the DOI list um, in their satire. So yeah, I'd love to get some uh, comments from you, Mohammed, on the implementation of DOI, and if. Um, you know, what Julie has said is true in terms of a kind of a gap between the policy and often the implementation as well. Thanks, Masa. Uh, that's a that's a big question. So there are many details and let me let me try to just break them down one by one. And let me actually start by saying how valuable we think the oversight board is. We extremely value their work, their recommendations. Um, and their insights and, and policy and policy sometimes also um, um, clear policy advice. Um, Julie and her fellow members of the, of, of the oversight board are doing an extremely impactful job. Um, and we value their recommendations very, very high. And we share also, so when the oversight board, as Julie said, they, they issue a decision related to a specific piece of content, but also they provide um, policy advice. And their decisions regarding piece of content is a binding one. We comply with that decision instantly. Um, and the provide you know, the provided policy advice are also things that we publicly share the progress of compliance with the board and with the users in our in a quarterly basis. So for instance, the board now, according to the last quarter, which has 55 recommendations, uh, we have complied with 19 of them and 17 uh, 15 are actually in the pipeline. Um, so, and, and we share that information publicly so that the public know the impact that the oversight board uh, has on Meta's policies. And Julie mentioned specific examples and I can mention even more, but uh, for the Ojalan case, for instance, this policy related to the respect of human rights um, of designated individuals is now even in the community standards 
because of the oversight board's um, um, recommendation. And we took that recommendation seriously and complied um, directly. The oversight board's decisions or recommendations, either on policy or product or transparency, get also within different teams' roadmaps so that we ensure that they are in a, the appropriate process for implementation. That's that. That's just to start to to pick up on on Judy's extremely important points. Um, when it comes to the DUI policy or the dangerous organizations and individuals policy, the objective of this policy is to prevent offline harm, to prevent dangerous actors from utilizing social media to spread their propaganda, or to incite violence, or to recruit and fundraise or further their goals using our services. So it's extremely helpful uh, to have the policy and the technologies that help us act as fast as possible in preventing that type of behavior from being circulated on our platform. Um, according to the policy, we prevent the praise, um, uh, remove, uh, sorry, praise, substantive support and representation of entities. And let me just explain that in a little bit more uh, of more details, although we share that publicly also in the community standards. Praise is speaking more positively and justifying the violence or the activity of a, of a dangerous organization or giving it a sense of achievement, which is part of the whole spectrum of, of dangerous organizations' propaganda spreading. The substantive yeah. support is at attempting to, to raise funds, to recruit, um, and representation is actually having presence on the platform. However, we allow discourse that are related to news reporting condemnation, neutral discussion, and disapproval through satire. Um, right. But Mohammed, I think um, I think a lot of our listeners, they're kind of aware that the policy, and I think a lot of the communities that we work with, they're very much against um, the Revolutionary Guards. But you know, the ongoing problem in this particular community is that we are not seeing that nuance applied. Like I, I've been working with the, a, a dissident rapper that's in exile, and he created music um, that was, uh, you know, criticizing the Revolutionary Guards and his artwork was the Revolutionary Guards logo kind of made with graffiti for the album art. And every time this was posted, it would just get automatically removed, even though it was very clear in the captions, the album art. But um, I mean, it seemed like there was some sort of automated um, detection that Instagram was using that there wasn't even room for the moderation to have any nuance to understand, okay, this is criticism, this is satire, this is art that's not in support of this organization. And so this is the type of, these are the type of cases we see every day. We see the policy is against support, but in actual implementation of, you know, the hundreds of cases we see, this is not actually what's happening. So one, it, it's, it's important also to highlight that one, we train our reviewers on how to understand the context in which the, a, a given content is being shared. Uh, but it's also important, and we share that on the community standards, it's also important for the users to make, to make it explicit and clear that the intention of the content is not to praise, support, or represent a designated entity. Um, so, this, especially in news reporting, and it's not only a Farsi issue, or not, or not really specifically related to the Persian market or the Persian um, uh, users, um, it's a nuanced issue and extremely uh, critical to strike the right balance between assessing whether the piece of content actually aims to further a dangerous organization's agenda, or it's factually, neutrally reporting um, or engaged with the activity of the dangerous organization. Um, and, and let me here explain also how, how, because you mentioned the banks, and let me also explain how banks work. And it's a little bit technical, but we have different banks that do different things. Um, and the core objective of the bank, and this is an extremely important technology, is to prevent the resharing of dangerous content shared by the- You're dangerous referring activity. to the media banks that your automated systems would be using when you're talking about banks. Exactly, exactly. And, and, and we have different banks, as I said, uh, one of them is actually directly related to gore, violence and incitement that shared by terrorists and hate organizations, and we prevent that we share on or, um, of that type of content in all circumstances, like perpetrator generated content of, of an actual terrorist activity or mass shooting. However, we have other banks that triage content that's labeled by the automation to human reviewer to assess whether the caption is supportive 
or of the organization or its activity or actually neutrally discussing it um, yeah. and, and here oh. mm -hmm. uh, so and here comes the nuance um it's it, it's sometimes it's, this is an adversarial environment and we always try to err on the side of safety and to ensure that our platform is safe from terrorist activity and and, and hateful organizations propaganda I don't I don't discount the fact that this is a very difficult um, issue to tackle, but I think the the uh, amount of mistakes we've seen ha has like mm. raised a lot of concerns and I would love Rana to jump in and. Uh, Mohammed, uh, sorry, I don't want to uh, move away from the topic we're talking about, but um, what I struggle with is the actual process where there's a feeling that there's no transparency as how. Uh, Meta decides what to keep on these platforms and what to remove. Would you mind just telling us when um, a user posts a, a, a content, what happens? So is it a, an automated removal or is an individual uh, sits there and looks at them? Can you explain that, please? For sure. Um, so what happens is that we have a mix of technology and human reviewers. Also, automation and human reviewers and content come to our knowledge, either if reported by a user or if our automation um, flags it to a human reviewer. Um, in both situations, the content is tested and assessed against our community standards. And if it was violating, we remove it and we send notification to our to the user specifying that the content has been by removed and to give them also an opportunity for appeal so the user who face um, content removal can appeal our decision and then this appeal is reviewed um, and if the violation stands or the assessment stands it the content will remain down and if not we will store it uh, so this is simply the process we are trying to improve the transparency and we know that we didn't do enough, we still need to do more on transparency, and we have many things in place. So the appeals, the notifications, but also most recently, we created the account status in, um, in, in, in Instagram, which you can get to through the settings button. Um, and it tells you everything that happened on the, on the accounts and to what extent did we engage with it? Did we remove any content? Is there any feature limits? And the user can actually appeal any of these decisions to us and we can review and correct if, if if any mistake was taken okay so there are two levels one is the automated uh, system one is human reviewer would the automated system automatically remove content because it has been mass reported because we have cases uh, that uh, content has been removed so rather very quickly after they're posted um and when you look at it there's nothing wrong with that is that the machine making that decision or an individual it can be it can be actually one of three things and i understand that here is as an area that we are also need to do to do more in terms of transparency it can be a human judgment error yes sometimes uh, although we train uh, reviewers we audit on weekly basis uh, many of their decisions to make sure that there is uh, that uh, there is accurate uh, and non unbiased approach towards content review um, but mistakes happen and two um, it can be an automation error and we also audit automation enforcement to try to correct that. But also sometimes it's bugs and technical glitches that cause um, uh, content, content removal, although without a specific uh, violation to our policies. And I know sometimes this is hard to believe um, with, with a big tech company to have tech to have technical glitches, but this is a fact. Any yeah. tech company would fall into that. And, may, and I know the frustration there because sometimes there would be no reason for the content to be taken down. And I can give you a few examples if you want. Um, most recently, um, uh, Bella Hadid, for instance, in, in May 15, um, we had a problem with the way videos um, are spread in, in, in the Instagram feed. Um, and at the time, Bella was discussing several issues related to Palestine. Um, and the issue was technical, the content, um, um, the, the technical editor was taken down or less recommended because of the technical glitch, but uh, her followers, uh, people, her fans, herself would potentially perceive that as, as, um, as us taking the content because of its substance, and that was absolutely not the case. We only take content down if it violates the policy. But we are an, an additional, important, extremely important point that we are doing now to increase 
transparency around these circumstances is that we are testing a notification system currently in the US, and I'm confident, hopeful as well, that we can roll that out widely, that tells people when their account was hit by a technical bug or um, 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 you know, a, a technological uh, glitch, so that people know why their content was taken down and also to give us to give more transparency on the reasons any action has been taken on their account. So, I mean, I think this is really important to talk about because I think the um, perception or the conspiracy theories that run rampant about why um, Meta is getting so much wrong when it comes to Persian content. And of course, like you said, um, the same issues have been ongoing in Arabic. There's been a massive movement for transparency and accountability on how content about Palestine um, is being moderated by Meta. And I know we're waiting for the business for social responsibilities audits of the processes Meta uses for Palestine takedown. But um, I mean, I really want Rana to touch on this as well, which is just the, the feeling or perceptions within um, the Persian community about the moderations and the conspiracies, which, you know, are actually founded on actual events. So Rana, please give us some. Um, yes, I'm glad that we uh, eventually got here because I understand the argument about uh, terrorist organizations or de de dangerous organizations and individuals um, and incitement of violence. That's a very difficult topic. And, and I understand all the uh, challenges facing that. But one of the reasons that the Persian community uh, is uh, getting more and more suspicious slash frustrated is because mistakes keep uh, being repeated. So a mistake can happen once, a mistake can happen twice. But when you see that every other week, every other month, we have content that is criticizing the Iranian government removed from meta platforms, then that really fuels conspiracy theories uh, about what is happening behind the scene. To give you an example, January uh, 7th, 2022 was the anniversary of the downing of a passenger airplane PS752 by the Iranian Revolutionary Guards. Um, the, the family, the association of the family members uh, were trying to start a campaign about uh, their, their uh, call for justice about uh, that incident. And they had a hashtag, I will light a candle too. And to everybody's shock and horror, on the day we found out that hashtag was blocked by Instagram. Um, then obviously there was an outcry and Meta responded and they said it was a mistake. But frankly, until today, I can't understand how a mistake like that can happen. And more importantly, I want to know whether these kind of mistakes are being investigated internally. Because if mistake after mistake is happening in favor of the Islamic Republic, I think that the Persian community and the civil society would like to know why and is Meta seriously looking into these incidents because these are serious issues for Persian speakers who are using your platform. Yeah, so I, I totally understand um, that when a piece of content is taken down, especially or even if repeated times and sometimes without a clear justification, that would lead people um, towards making their own conclusions. I totally understand that. But what I want to stress, and I'll answer specifically to the, to the cases that you, you raised, Rana, is that there is only good intentions in the teams and the people working behind the scenes to set the policies and to enforce them. And we take every push error, every in inaccuracy in enforcement very seriously. And we try to correct them, to learn from them, and to try to improve whether this was a policy gap or an enforcement error, and then try to cover that and not to repeat it again. And let me be specific and target quickly the point you mentioned regarding hashtag, I would like a candle. So the hashtag does not violate our policies. And it, it was the, the substance of the content sharing with it, shared with it was actually also not violating the policies. However, it was, blocked temporarily because there was many content shared not necessarily linked to the main message of the hashtag that violated our policy specifically the dangerous organizations and individuals policy and that trigger, triggered in the system you know we block hashtags when they are when they have a certain percentage of 
violating content. And let me be clear, blocking a hashtag does not mean taking the content down. We don't remove the content when we block the hashtag. It just makes the hashtag unsociable. So we, we, the system did that automatically because of the, the violations um, of the DOI policy um, associated with the hashtag. But then when we learned about this action and we assessed that type of content, we found that the violating content is not actually co connected to the message or the actual purpose of the hashtag. So we took down the violating content, we restored the access to the hashtag, and none of the content that was shared that had the hashtag was taken down if it wasn't violating. Um, so this is to, to, to be absolutely clear about that, but it's important to know that we value that the Iranian community is using Instagram. And we have seen even in the last month, hundreds of thousands of engagements around the protests in reels, stories, um, posts, in Instagram from all over the country and that you know is a message that we have that mandate there and we want to make sure that the iranian users have that access to instagram and to use it and to have a safe experience as well um Thank you so, much. so you mean that the hashtag was being abused by other people and that's why your it was flagged so the hash many people who potentially would have you know counter narratives to the main one related to the hashtag was sharing content and that content was potentially violating for the DUI policy and that triggered the automatic the automatic you know so, um, so like the Islamic Rep Republic of Iran which is well known for having you know propaganda campaigns and you know troll armies if they potentially wanted to populate that hashtag with problematic content you're saying they could have abused this rule to take down this hashtag no what I'm saying is that there was you know, uh, people who were sharing um, uh, content counter narrative to the main message of the hashtag. And we have systems in place to, to face coordinated and authentic behavior and to take down networks when we have evidence of them. But in these circumstances, we, um, with that, we restored immediately the hashtag once we knew that the violating content was not actually linked to the main message of the hashtag. So there was no reason, and and we acted fast on that once we learned about that about about that. But that's because they had the media behind them. I, 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 what what where I worry is that similar cases happen, and they don't have that media power behind them. And and that's why, Rana, one of like meetings like the one we are having now, and many engagements with the members of the community, civil society, and academia, is extremely important for us to get this feedback because. We learn about it when we talk more about it and when we talk to you to talk to activists and experts and and, and this is an example of them um, and we are keen to have more about that and we have done that and it's important also to flag something that our policies are done based on an extremely consultative and iterative process and we engage with experts and civil society from all over the world before we decide that a piece of content should be taken down based on a policy we engage with you know, everyone because we know that we we don't own the truth we don't know everything and so we built an extremely consultative process that engage stakeholders inside the company from different perspectives and outside the company from different um you know uh, backgrounds to make sure that a diverse opinions mm. are fed into the policy development process so i mean before we leave this topic and i saw someone from the audience um uh ask the same question which i just asked which is the potential for manipulation which i think we've um addressed but before we leave this topic i i think it, it would i would be remiss not to mention the bbc persian report done by rana's colleague uh parham um parham Wobadi about um the center in essen so this bbc report I mean, I, th I don't think there was any smoking gun, but the there has been a lot of concern over, um, you know, the potential for the Islamic Republic of Iran to be able to, you know, bribe or infiltrate these content moderators that are hosted in this contracted center in SN Germany. And I know in reaction, 
uh, Meta has said, and um, I Rana, I don't know how to phrase this better, but I think the response was that there was going to be an investigation into that center in Essen. I would, you know, Rana, um, before Mohammed goes, I would love for your two cents on this topic and then to get Mohammed's reaction. Yes, I, I'm, I'm glad that, uh, we, we, we're here now. So the, the, the automation we talked about, and now we're talking about um, human reviewers. And as we know, uh, many of these human uh, reviewers are on, are on very low salaries and uh, we know that Iran allegedly has offered uh, something between five to ten thousand uh, dollars to have those people who are in charge of reviewing uh, Persian content uh, to shut down certain accounts like Masi Ali Nejad, Iran, one of Iran's most famous um, political activists. Um, so I would like to know um, whether there is a vetting process and what exactly happens in Essen? And how can you make sure that these people are not groomed by the Islamic Republic in order to serve uh, their agenda? Of course, I'm, I'm equally happy that you raised this issue, Masa and, and Rana. Um, and I think it's a good opportunity for us being here to talk about it. Um, and we take these uh, investigations and claims extremely seriously. Um, and I can assure to you that there is absolutely no connection or affiliation between Toulouse International, our outsource in essence in Germany, um, and the Iranian regime. Um, we have abs found absolutely not no officially, Mohammed. But how do you know that the staff there are not uh, manipulated? So th there is a system in place, and let me actually elaborate that. So one, the representative or the, the reviewer cannot know which type of content or which content they will review because jobs is assigned to them you know, randomly. And we have clear policies written in clear language with the objective that if two people would make a decision around a piece of content, would make the same decision. So we don't leave room for subjectivity or bias for our reviewers. And we conduct weekly audits, random audits of samples from the content that the reviewers do um, review, and we assess the accuracy and we correct and train them further if there is any um, inaccuracy or something substantial that we need to, to, to understand. And we provide trainings when they are onboarded, including trainings on bias and everything, but we also provide follow-up trainings to make sure that they are aware of policy updates and the policy new ones. And there is also some issues that were raised in the, in the, in the article that suggested few stuff which I would like to highlight, like for instance, that a representative can go to the locker, report a piece of content from his phone or their phone and come back to the room and then action the content. This is just not possible because it assumes that the reviewer knows which, which content will come to their queue and that doesn't happen, it goes randomly. And also some of the claims that uh, we only review 10% or we audit 10% and hence the reviewers have full liberty to take biased decisions in the remaining 90%. That's also not true because we the, 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 the actual auditing happens on random sample, statistically random sample that they can't predict. The rep will not know which content are we going to audit. So we take these acquisitions and, and, and claims extremely seriously and we uh, have conducted specifically for um, for that for that um, for that claim um, another accuracy assessment and we an audit and we found that Toulouse um, accuracy rate is actually very good and it's actually similar to the rest oversight uh, sorry the rest review outsourced uh, offices around the world uh, and we find absolutely no evidence of that bias. So it is worrying because that's not the feeling of the Persian users of, of Meta, because we uh, that there's not that feeling that there is accuracy in uh, content moderation, spe especially in the last couple of weeks. There were protests in south of Iran, in Abadan, even a, a news channel like Iran International, their content was being removed. So th that is why these conspiracy theories are rampant, as Massa says, because you say you are auditing uh, the content, but our experience from this side of the spectrum is quite different from what you say. So it's important to, to also recognize the scale on uh, um, uh, which we, we, we operate. If we are, we are operating on a scale of almost 3 billion users, if we get it 99% right and only 1% wrong, that's a huge chunk. And I wouldn't justify even the 19, the 1% would not be just, mm -hmm. justifiable under any circumstances. So we wanna do more. 
on improving accuracy and transparency when action is taken. This is something that's top of our mind, top of our agenda, and many teams are working on that. Uh, but it's also important to, to, to also say to our audience from Iran and the wider communities that there is absolutely no bad intention. Only good intentions are within the company for all our communities. And also let's know that Instagram is actually being used so widely in political and social discourse. Um, and it is at working to a, to a very, very high extent. Um, so we need to we need to get that absolutely solid. And then without a doubt. So I... Mohammed, when do these um, human reviewers make these mistakes, uh, is there a process to go back and find which individual has done uh, has done it? Um, I I'm not sure I can get back to you on that. I can I can learn more about that. But we but it's important to know that if we find that error or if we find systemic inaccuracy, everyone will be subject to an additional training and review. So it's not we we, we won't target. But it's more than just training, Mohammed. This is this is now serving the Islamic Republic's political message and agenda. So if an individual is working to serve the Islamic Republic of Iran, then the users would like to know, because this is not just about what is published, this is now about the, the privacy of users. If these people have access to private information and, and direct messages, that, that can be very worrying for uh, Persian speakers. All right, so it's important to know that the, the reviewers only can see the content and they can only judge based on the face value. Okay, that's what I'm saying. They, they, they can't access uh, personal information of of um, of the users, and it's also again. Let me reiterate, Raman. Uh, everyone needs to know that the accuracy level in Toulouse International is really high, and we have audited that. And also that the the random audit that happens every week. Sorry, Mohammed. Is... Just to interrupt you, I'm wondering if there's any mechanism or any plans by Meta to be able to make those audits public, because you know from the very little data collection we've done to try to outreach with Persian users. I mean, for just one week, we tried to get to document the takedowns, and we had I think in the span of like two or three days, we just we had 200, and that was just the networks Article 19 was able to reach out to. And I think there's a disconnect between Iranians actually finding the processes to make their reports. They don't always know how to do it technically within. So I don't always think that you have the mechanism to, to have direct access into the mistakes that are happening in the Persian community. Because I think between Rana and I and others in the community, there's like thousands of cases that just don't get reported and probably don't get into your data. So I think it would be really important to just have a little bit of more robust um, investigations into exactly what's happening. Because, you know, it, we might be wrong, what we're seeing might be 0.001%, but it does seem to be having a massive impact. Um, and moving towards that kind of, um, yeah, ability to have uh, that transparency or investigation would be really great. And I know you can't give me that promise right now. So I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll change the I'll change the the topic really quickly, because I know we're going to hit the end mark of our uh, discussion. Um, uh, actually, can I just um, someone has a question actually from inside Iran from a nonprofit um saying that uh they work in civic education in iran and their content is being taken down due to violations of community standards how can we solve this issue on an organizational level not on a post by post basis what is the procedure and i think that kind of speaks to the fact that no one really knows or maybe doesn't necessarily have access to the policies to know what they're doing wrong um uh but the policies are public we have since 2018 our policies are public the community standards is available and it's available in the farsi language so i encourage everyone to actually visit our transparency center which is rich of many information including what you were talking about masa we we share information about our enforcement uh, we share information about our the proactive as well as user reporting enforcement and also government take down requests speaking of the point, the point julie uh, highlighted earlier so there's a lot of information shared publicly that the user can access and understand more about yeah um, so we have 10 minutes left, so I'm going to open up this one topic that's quite big. So I'm going to open up the topic of protest, um, which I know, Mohammed, you probably have a lot to say about because I, I, I know you, um, you know, you've 
uh, you've uh, you, you follow protests and obviously Rana as a journalist um, I think for you it's incredibly important how you know citizen journalists or ordinary Iranians on the ground in Iran document things like protests and the human rights violations that occur or just the newsworthy worthy things that occur and they're posted um on instagram especially instagram um so i mean uh, bbc has been in, in touch and interviewed them uh, i've been following the work and have been following the role of one of these protest collectives 1500 test fear that has been operating all across iran to get a lot of this documentation and so um, I mean, I think in recent days, they haven't been having a lot of takedowns because they have learned to self-censor, which I'm not sure is a good thing. Um, but, and this was a thing that, you know, we saw happening with news organizations, countless Iranian users, which was protest footage that contained just Magbar um, Khamenei or Magbar Raisi or Magbar Basij, any of these other, you know, fill-ins for death to the dictator, specialized to Iran, was getting taken down. Um, first of all, I would love Rana to speak about, you know, the the need to have this documentation, despite the fact that, you know, I, I don't think any of us like like to wish death upon anyone. But this is just the nature and fact of protests. Um, yeah, Rana, just tell me a little bit about documenting and following protests using social media. Mohammed, as an Egyptian who remembers the, the uh, revolution in Egypt, you, you're aware of the nature of these protests. And I understand that a lot of the policies that are written by Meta uh, is for, for the American society and American politics. But the nature of a lot that is happening in a theocracy like Iran is it's very different. And my worry is that a lot of the content is being treated as if they are happening in a democracy. Um, and as a result, the flow of information outside the country, which we heavily rely on, uh, is now censored because, uh, as I said earlier, that's our sometimes that's our only window inside the country. And if that those contents are being removed, it means that the, the uh, information flow is disrupted. So um, I wonder whether there is a solution or whether it always have to be a case by case uh, and civil society going to Meta and explaining the situation or whether that there could be a blanket uh, rule for each country uh, based on their political situation. Um, thank you so much, Rana. This is an extremely important issue. Um, and I, let me start with the point that our community standards and our policy is designed for our entire community of users. And 90% of them, almost 90% of them, is outside North America. So we develop these policies with this fact in mind. And our team, the team I belong to, is actually extremely international, very diverse, and located around 13 offices around the world. So we don't design these policies only for the users in North America at all. And we don't only consult with activists and, and think tanks and civil society there. We consult with, with a diverse background uh, of civil society and activists and uh, human rights organizations from all over the world. Um, so that's important to flag. Um, and having said that, we are still keen all the time to continue to engage in conversations around our policies um, to ensure that this is a global policy and that the global policy is as to, to, as, to, to as large extent as possible is also meeting the new ones um, right. that are expected in different contexts. Um, so this is this is something that we that we care. To, to 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 achieve um and if, if you want me to specifically uh, address the... oh, yeah let's specifically address because we have we're so short on time so death to khamenei um it's been well documented that this exception was given before um we saw the exception given um in july 2021 it was documented uh in a vice article um and there is a precedent for exceptions. In fact, you know, there were a number of exceptions given for the Ukraine war. And I know, Mohammed, you say you respect the oversight board a lot, but the oversight board even had a reaction to the fact that Meta has asked the oversight board not to deliberate on any cases related to Ukraine and Russia. Um, and I think in their statement, they said they were disappointed that Meta is not allowing um, them to deliberate on those cases, which I assume would also include some of the, uh, the exceptions. And it's, it's such a shame that, you know, Julie and the oversight board can't he come here and talk about you know creating i guess consistent 
contextual policies like you know we look at how protests emerge in iran and we don't think protests are ever going to stop in iran anytime soon but you know magbar khamenei as long as he's alive is probably going to be part and parcel of protests and therefore part of protest footage and protest content um so how do we come to terms with the fact that we should not be um censoring protests and it's you know and often like rana knows this as well it's, you have citizen journalists posting this documentation for purposes of news and meta is removing it so uh, these are these are many issues and i think i would take from them two specifically like to directly address your concern about death death to uh, hashtags or content and the news reporting and when it comes to death to um, our violence and incitement policy um, is you know designed to prevent offline harm and events to prevent the incitement of violence on our platform yes. and also that includes preventing uh, calls for death to anyone including journalists activists and heads of states um, and and you know to your point earlier rana uh, we we feel like and we think as a private company that it's not appropriate that we make value judgments around uh, what's a democracy and what's not and 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 when is it allowed for somebody to say this to an individual because we don't know 100% the intention behind everyone who's sharing that type of content so having said that um we we disallow that type of content and however we still allow discussions around it or news reporting so entities that cover um, the events in Iran are, you know, that's, that's definitely content that's that's allowed, um, even if it covers, you know, the protests and the creeds and everything that's being said. Uh, this is something that we we allow on our platform, either used by, um, um, you know, an authentic news entity or independent journalists and 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 citizen journalists. Uh, these are things that that we definitely allow. But it's important to flag that there is a lot of content and discourse that's sharing our platform discussing the protest and people's demands already on meta and on instagram and we're very proud that instagram is giving people that opportunity so are we uh, so finally as you mentioned news uh, news stations as i said even content from iran international was being removed and um our other um panelist who uh, failed to join us today sino vadiola his content has also been removed and what i find bizarre it's not always protest it's not always death too but as someone who who's um by far iran's most famous political satirist his content is constantly being reported and removed which i find weird because he's a verified user he he has worked for prestigious news channels and tv organizations so he knows a lot of editorial guidelines and he abides by them and he's probably Iran's Jimmy Fallon or Trevor Noah. And I wonder whether Meta ever removes their content. Does something similar happen to them when their content is constantly, and, and his content is political satire? I know that Meta says satire is very complicated, but he, when someone is, uh, is followed by over 7 million people and is verified, why are his uh, uh, content being removed? So on, on, on the specifically the case of, of Sina, because we, we have been in conversation with him and we reviewed his account and we found no removal of content for the last year at the very least. Um, so we are now in conversation to understand whether there was some technical issues at his end while uploading content. Um, and I'm pleased to see um, Sina sharing a lot of his content videos discussing in his um, satirical approach the situation in Iran. Um, but our records show that, like for policy violations or even error, uh, with that the last one happen. was yesterday, Mohammad. I'm, I'm sure he will send you. But uh, exactly, we, we are in conversation with him. Yes. Absolutely, we are, we are <laughs> yes. in conversation with him. The last and one was yesterday removed. Yes. Um, so oh, we, we we're short have... of time. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Masa, uh, you're mute. Masa, I think you're muted. Sorry, as we come to conclude this session, um, clearly, I don't think we've solved all our problems, but we've really tried to, I think, hopefully uh, shed some light on policies or confusions there are. Um, I still think there is a lot to be desired from Meta to still do more, to be more transparent, to put more resources into Persian. Um, Mohammed might disagree with me, but I think if you have um, insight into the voices of the community, um, and I mean, we had someone else in the audience comment that 
they were saying that every community thinks that uh, meta is stacked against them, which might just say that this is a problem of scale. And that might very well be it. But I think the point we're trying to say is that this is so important. And I know, Mohammed, you and your colleagues at Meta work very hard. Um, I'm often in, in touch with them, so I don't discount the fact that you guys care. Um, I think it's just we're looking for systemic approaches to solving these problems and ensuring that, you know, Meta continues to be a platform that is serving um, the Iranian people in this very uh, contested space. Uh, if you have any final remarks, please uh, make them very short in a few seconds before we are cut off. <laughs> Yeah, I'm also going to be uh, very grateful to you, Mohammed, and your time and the fact that you have listened to our concerns. And I, I would add to Matha's comment that we need more transparency, spe specifically about the investigation in Telos International and the individuals who are allegedly working uh, with the Iranian government. Because if you're transparent uh, about that investigation, then the trust from Persian uh, speakers might come back. Because at the moment, there are serious questions about what's going on there. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. And I, I would like to reiterate quickly that Instagram is a place where people are using for their voice and to explain and to shed light on events on the ground. We really care about getting this right, um, and we will continue to invest uh, resources and technologies to improve that. And we understand when things build up, sometimes they paint a picture that's not necessarily accurate. I want to assure everyone joining us in this discussion that this is not the case and that we hope to improve that and to solve all problems needed. Thank you. Yeah, and I hope uh, there can actually be a Iran case at the oversight board. And um, yeah, thanks to Julie for joining and sending her interventions. And uh, apologies if anyone came to see um, Sina uh, who could not make it today. But yes, thank you, Mohammed. Thank you, Rana. Thank